I am Naisha Garza. And I'm Rob Garza. And we live in Navarre, Florida, in a panhandle um, near Pensacola. Daniel was born May of 2006. So our journey began April 2007. Daniel was just a happy, curious... Walking, talking. Walking, talking a little. You know, he started walking around nine to ten months. All right. So um, everything, you know, we just... We were in Alaska. Um, Robert and I um, were both active duty Air Force. So yes, and he has uh, our oldest daughter, Natalia. She was four when Daniel was born, right? So we just just living, going through life, right? And then Daniel, um, the he started having high fevers, right? So he would go to the daycare, the CDC, um, the daycare on base. And then, you know, if they have high fevers or things like that, they have to, we have to pick them up, right? But then his um, teachers started noticing different things about Daniel that, like, um, his walking was unstable. He just seemed like, um, like there was just a lot going on. And so we were taking him to the ER, to the pediatrician, I know, from on base. A- on base, yeah, from April starting in April until um, June. Yes, so we were in and out of the the, um, doctor's office, pediatrician in Elmendorf, on Elmendorf Air Force Base. So the first thing they diagnosed him with was RSV. So he got diagnosed with RSV. Um, He was hospitalized, I think, for like a day or two. And then after that, it was... Um, ear infections, ear infection and teething, right? Because he wasn't a year yet. So the high fevers, since he had ear infection, everything is walking. They're saying it's caused by the ear infection. So everything kind of tied with something. And then, um, then his face started drooping. And then they also said that was ear infection. So um, it was connected to the ear infection. So... Um, and then in June, his whole left side, his left side, right? Went limp. Yeah, his whole left side just went limp. I know Robert, it was a Saturday, and Robert was, he was actually at um, Bible study. study. And so it was me, Natalia, and Daniel at home. And then I went, because um, I think he was crying. And so when I went to go get him out of his bed, that's when I just noticed his whole, like his whole left side was limp. So, yeah, so we rushed him. Um, to, to the, the ER. Yeah, rushed him to the ER. Robert met me there. Um, and it just so happened that the pediatrician that was been treating Daniel, he was actually the pediatrician on call. So that was a blessing because we didn't have to go through all the stories, like, you know, the whole story of what was going on. He already knew about Daniel. And then that's when they um, did an MRI and found lesions on his brain. Then we were rushed to the hospital the children's hospital in uh, Anchorage. Yes. And um, and the neuro was the the lead doctor because that's since they found the lesions on his brain. He was the the first doctor that Daniel saw. And then um, he we were in the PICU and he was also in isolation because he had RS since he had a history of RSV, they put him on was quarantine isolation. Yeah, isolation. Yeah. Or yeah, like we had to wear gowns and stuff going in there. And so it was because June 2nd, I remember June 2nd is when we went to the Anchorage Children's Hospital. And so from June 2nd and because June 15th, he was diagnosed with HLH. So from the 2nd to about the 15th, they didn't know what was going on. Right. So we had... um because they found out his liver was enlarged, his spleen. So they had cardio. What else? They had so many. They had so many different specialists come in, trying to figure it out. And they're saying, "Hey, if we don't figure it out, Daniel wasn't gonna make it." Right? And so Daniel started having seizures. He was having seizures. So when we got to the ho- children hospital, then he started having seizures. So then that's when they were saying, "Hey, we don't know what's going on. You know, he's not going to. Um, if we don't figure it out, he's not gonna." It's not gonna make it, and so that's when they brought in Hemoc. So Hemoc came in. There's like it's either two things: leukemia, 
or this rare disorder called histiocytosis, hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis. So, and then they, you know, it's explaining everything, like the difference between the two. And then that's when, um, so when they did the test, came back with leukemia, he had um, HLH. And then there's two forms, the familia or the secondary. So we had to get, um, so they said it's one or the other. So that's when we got genetic testing, got genetic, did genetic testing. And it was genetic, it was the familia. And so, yeah, then you want to. Yeah, so over the course of pretty much three days, he went from a walking, talking young boy to neurologically devastated and had to be tube fed. Getting the diagnosis, it even got to the point where I just, because Daniel, you know, he, like I say, he was happy. He was talking, but at this point, he was just kind of like he um, wasn't really responding a lot. So we had, um, so we were going to get him tested um, to see what's he on the spectrum because okay, so this, you know, we were trying to rule out everything. And before we even had the, uh, it was the healthy kids. So even before they were supposed to come that Monday, but that Saturday's when his oh, everything went limp. So we didn't even, um, yeah, so that's what we we're doing. You know, we were just trying to figure out what was going on because nobody knew and everybody said it's an ear infection, but it was like, it gotta be something, right? Cause he just always high fevers and rashes and, and everything just changed. Yeah. So yeah, so our whole world turned around just that quick. Well, I don't really know that they were knowledgeable because it was so rare and they knew that they had to kind of fight the ramping up of the white blood cells. So I want to say they used steroids for that. Yes, I yeah, I think they did start with steroids. They started with steroids just to try to keep it at bay, but they seemed to think that he was only going to live like three and a half months after the diagnosis. Yeah. And so we were going through, as parents, obviously, we're, that's, we're not accepting that. So uh, we went on the rampage as, as far as like researching and finding out, okay, well, is there a cure? What's the next step? How do we put this fire out and continue to fight the good fight for Daniel to make sure that he has every opportunity to to live as possible. And so that's when the fight really began because it sometimes it feels like, I, I get it, doctors are super educated, they're experts in their field, but they don't always have the greatest communication skills. And that was kind of the case in our instance where not only were we fighting the good fight for Daniel and trying to do everything we could to make sure that he was taken care of, but we were also having to, we had some bumps in the road with the doctors along the way and that that only complicated things even more because um, just in regards to the their people skills, for instance, weren't always the, the greatest and having a little bit of empathy. I mean, I get it. You want to tear the bandaid off. Got it. That, that works. But when you're telling a family that their child is going to die in the next three months, that's, that's not something that I, I don't think is necessarily what you should do. So there's a lot more moving parts to just, yes, you're going through this journey, but at the same time, I don't feel like one, it's a rare disease. We need to bring raise awareness and bring attention, but two, we also need to talk about the communication barriers between the doctors and what the families go through as they're going through that journey is like super important because I get everybody's path is different, but I think it's super important that we, we take a step back and look at all the outer outlying factors that come into play as well yes yeah and, and if i'm being completely honest and and transparent i i i was really angry with the air force because i feel like we missed it when it came to daniel but at the same time if we did if we weren't active duty i don't know how we would have got through that as far as the medical bills and all the things that I can't, I, as, as much as it pains me, I can't say a good enough, enough good things about how the Air Force was there for us, even though they, well, I shouldn't say, I shouldn't put that on the Air Force, but the fact that we missed it is, we just missed it. But it's just very difficult because our family went through a lot of things 
and the whole time we were focused on Daniel and making sure he was taken care of. But as individuals, we went through a lot as well. The Air Force making sure that we were put in the right places. We found where there were doctors. Naisha was constantly researching doctors. Okay, who's going to be the best fit for us? Who's going to, you know, who's going to be the best fit for Daniel? And um, the Air Force went out of their way to make sure that wherever it was that we were trying to get, that they got us there. So I, I feel like it's important that we, we say that as well. Yes. So Daniel, um, so he was admitted in a hospital from June to I believe August. And so, sorry, in Italian, so that, so she was four when she was born, so she was five and she was just getting ready to go into kindergarten. So she was about to start her um, first year of school. Daniel got out in September and she was starting this school a few weeks later. So it was definitely, and then um, like we were both active duty. And then when Daniel got sick, I decided to separate from the Air Force so I could be home taking care of him. So that's so, yeah. So we went from like a two income family to automatically a one income family. The air, you know, with the Air Force and being able to be able to do that, right? Because, um, because they're worried about the insurance. But since we were both active duty, um, at the time, um, Daniel and the our daughter was under me as the sponsor. And then, um, we were able to switch them over to Robert. Daniel got a out the hospital in September, and I separated from the Air Force that October. And we lived in the hospital yes. from June to September. Yes, from June to September. Um, you know, we lived there. Thank God we had, um, we did have a, a, a good church family and support system because, you know, we're in Alaska, so we're not near our family, you know, our families. My family was in Florida. Robert's family was in Texas. So um, we did have people that were able to come in and be with Natalia for us. On the weekends, they would, um, so Natalia would be in the hospital all day. She would be with um, church family and, and their kids. So Robert, you know, he went, he had to go back to work. So he went to work when he got off, you know, taking Natalia to school, got off, picked her up. They come to the hospital and then we'll have dinner. And then um, him and Natalia would go back. And then sometimes we would switch where he would stay it was like on the weekends where he would stay and I would go home. But yeah, we pretty much, yeah, lived there. That was the world. Like I said, everything just turned upside down. And then when we brought Daniel home, he needed PT, he needed, you know, speech OT, therapy, yeah. speech therapy. So we had to um, home health care. So we're bringing all those things into the home. And even have, we even had to move out of the house we were in. Because the house we were in was a two-story, so we needed to get um, a single-story home just so accommodate for Daniel. To accommodate for Daniel, because by this time with the steroids and all that, he had you know he had got swollen. Wasn't you know we had to do the moving and switch you know. Uh, he was tube fed, so we yeah. had to make sure that we yeah. had to get the the tub the the bath the bathtub had to be a certain way so that we could put him in there to give him a bath and. I guess now looking back, it was like, you know, this was our new normal that, you know, we didn't, you know, that we didn't ask for. We didn't, you know, like, oh, what's, what's going on? Right. So it was definitely. And then even trying, you know, with Natalia, she's five. She was five at the time. So trying to have her understand what we didn't even understand. You know, so it was kind of, you know. Um, yeah, I, th I think when we look, well, when I look back, I think I making sure that she was that the other child is is understanding and and knowing what's going on because looking back maybe could have done a better job at that because you're so focused on the child that's dealing with so much that sometimes that you're just hyper focused on that and what you're going to do to help that child i hate to say it but the god's honest truth is the other the other child sometimes gets neglected I just feel like um, maybe that's not talked enough about either because we didn't know what we didn't know. You know what I mean? So it's not that it's done on purpose or with ill intention, but the fact that it happens. Even not being able to really deal with our emotions at this, you know, at this point, because we're trying to, you know, we're in survival mode, trying to make sure our son, you know, is going to make it. 
Absolutely. right? So I think that too takes it over, you know, it's just like, it's like Robert said, once we found out what HLH was, it was constant research. Yeah, that was right? the enemy and we were going to defeat it. Yes. That, was our, that was our focus. That was our mindset. Yeah. So I reached out to the Children's Hospital in Cincinnati because at that time, since this was 2007, they were the main hub, right? That's where the specialists were. The doctors at Anchorage, they had already given up on Daniel, right? So even when we wanted second test, you know, second opinions or, you know, like when we, the thing is that it has to be a bone marrow, right? For, um, for him to, you know, re- to recover, it's the bone marrow transplant. And so we couldn't, of course, because we have the trait. And then Natalia, um, our oldest daughter, she has the trait too. And our youngest daughter, Rihanna, she came, um, but she also has the trait. So, you know, we couldn't give it. So um, we just wanted, we just wanted to do everything, right? Not we stop, but let us hear them say no versus you kind of stopping it before it happens. But with the Cincinnati, I guess they had called the doctor, and um, the hemoc doctor in Alaska. So they wouldn't accept, they didn't take Daniel on. So then um, we reached out to Dr. McLean in Houston. So, um, and he did. <laughs> so he did. He just, you know, um, and then that's when we moved to, we got PCS to Lackland. Yeah, they, the Air Force moved us from uh, Alaska to San Antonio because that was the closest base they could get us to to where Dr. McLean was. And there, the doctors there, and these are on base doctors, it was just a blessing. Yeah, right? they were phenomenal, the yeah. doctors on base. Yes, doc, the doctors and on San base. Antonio. Yes, even Dr. McLean, you know, he was awesome. It was just such, such a different experience because they treated Daniel as. You know, the other ones, like I said, they had given up on him, right? So they wouldn't even talk into him. Well, not all of them. There was a nurse practitioner named Jan. She was amazing with Daniel, right? So she talked to him, you know, still talking to him and and treating him like, you know, he's still here. Definitely blessed because they, uh, even with our daughter Natalia, they, you know, were great with her too, the doctors. and, And then got pregnant before we moved to... Texas. So um, we got pregnant with our youngest daughter, Rihanna. So that was also now you're dealing with your son who's sick. And then on top of that, um, now we're you know, about to bring somebody new into the family. So it was just, um, there's a lot of emotions, definitely a lot that, that really didn't, um, even after, I think even after Daniel um, died, still wasn't dealing with emotion because you're still kind of, at this point, I had a five-month-old, so I have to take care of this five-month-old. And so it was just a lot. It wasn't until maybe um, after Rihanna was one that really started dealing with the emotions of Daniel's death. Yeah, yeah, the, definitely the grieving process. Everybody grieves in their own way. So the way that Naisha grieved was not necessarily the same way that I grieved. And so I think as couples, you know, talking about that as well is super important because um, I'm sure Naisha may have had questions like, well, why aren't you feeling the same way that I'm feeling or, you know, or vice versa? Because um, I, I, I didn't start really grieving, grieving until... He passed away in 2000, but honestly, probably like 2018, 2019. Like when I really started facing it, just putting that out there that I don't know if that's normal or not, but that's just the way that I agree. And it was a process too, because I know like he said for him, but for me, um, after Daniel died, I, at that point, my thing was, I don't want nobody to ever forget him, right? Because I think that's the thing, too, when, um, with parents, you know, that's the thing, right? I don't want nobody to forget <clears throat> my child, right? Um, so my thing was to, I hit the ground running. I went back to college. Daniel died. He died in 2009. I went back to college January 2010. So, um, and I kind of like process and I um, went to college to be a social worker. Um, what influenced that was the 
the case workers and social workers in Houston, I mean, in Texas, Daniel. yeah, they were like, you just need to focus on your, you know, just focus on Daniel, just focus on your family. You know, like they did everything, like all the home health care, everything. When like Daniel needed equipment. This is what I'll just, just yeah. call this number and I'll yeah. take care of you. They were yeah. awesome. They, yeah. So we didn't have to be on the phone trying to figure out where the equipment was going to come from, like even his formula and all that. So I said, I want to be able to do that for another family, right? To give them that support that we had. So that was my goal. That was my mission. When I got my bachelor's in social work and I got my master's, um, then I was working like at hospitals because I really wanted to be an oncologist social worker right but then things turned different and then I became a licensed clinical social worker so I started doing therapy because um with grief like you're saying it's even though it's it's always there right grief is always there it's very taboo the subject is very it's a very taboo subject nobody wants to talk about it everybody's uncomfortable with it Right. So it's um, so I wanted to create a space for families to be able to come and know that what they're feeling, like you're saying, it's normal. You know, you're what you're experiencing is a normal process. Right. With the grief. Right. Because we're dealing with things that are not the social norm. Right. The social norm is not for your child to die before you. So how do you navigate that? Right. So you got all these emotions that you're feeling and and it's like um. And I, I like the analogy that you gave too, but, but I also tell my clients, like, it's a, it's a journey with no destination. There's no destiny, you know, it's not like, cause you're always going, it's always going to be with you. Your grief is always with you. So I say, we learn to walk with it, right? Learning to walk with your grief. It's, it's your companion now, you, you know, you may not like it, right? But it, it's, it becomes a part of you. And um, so that was, so that's what I wanted to do, especially like um, educating, like, you know, about traumatic grief and helping families know that, yes, it's, it's not three months, right? It's not four months. It, this is forever because they feel like after a couple of months, okay, why am I not better? I'm like, you, you know, it doesn't, unfortunately, you know, it, it's, it's heartbreaking to say it doesn't, right? You, it becomes bearable and you adapt. Right. But the pain is always going to be there. We just in May, we established the um, Daniel D. Garza Foundation. The foundation is for us to advocate and educate with in regards to traumatic grief, but also bring an awareness to HLH. We want to be able to provide um, families that support and also provide scholarships to high school seniors who either have a sibling that have died from a rare disorder or even lost a parent. So yeah, so that's the goal of the Daniel D. Garza Foundation. And then also the for-profit art therapy center, Daniel's Harbor Therapy Center, is where we also provide um, counseling and for families or couples or that dealing with traumatic grief. Honestly, it's just so that people will know that they're not alone and that we're here for you, that somebody is in your corner, whether you know it or not, and we're here to help in any way that we can to help you go through this journey of whatever this situation is for your family. Because um, without a lot of the support that we had, to be able to, to offer that to another family is a huge blessing. To be able to prevent another child from losing their sibling is another blessing right? To be able to prevent another child from being misdiagnosed or being overlooked or, you know, to be able to catch it in time, you know, is, is that's the goal. Yes. That is the goal. Yes. To bring, um, I know the thing I always said is like, it needs to be a household name, right? Just like cancer, leukemia. Yeah. This needs to be, it should um, not just in September, but we, it needs to be something that people are talking about yeah i i hate day. i hate when i hear i shouldn't say hate but i really don't like when i hear so many other symptoms match with hlh i i, I would love to hear it as the other way around to where we're so focused on hlh that other other 
um, diseases match with the symptoms of HLH because there's not enough awareness. If doctors in every hospital don't know or have never heard of it, then, you know, we need to keep fighting a good fight until they do. Because, you know, it's aggressive, right? Like everything just turns just like that, right? You go from a healthy, happy, smiling little boy to, you know. Um, no Too one, fed, neurologically no, devastated, yeah. can't talk. Can't talk, you know, so. Um, it's a lot to drink, to take in. Yeah, yes, yeah. yeah so we, that is the goal is, is just to bring that awareness. And like, was like Robert's saying, that they're not alone on this journey because grief and this HLH journey is lonely. You know, not um, until I knew um, doing the research, I did found I found the Histio Aware um, Histi Awareness Organization um, when we were going through that with Daniel. So we were able to find um, you guys uh, at the beginning stages of that, but it was still kind of. I think it just kind of was so set on finding a cure that everything else kind of was just kind of on the wayside. You're not alone. There are, there are there are a lot of people that are here in your corner. You just don't know us yet. And continue to be your child's advocate, right? right. Be their voice. Continue to fight. I think that's the thing too, because since it is so misdiagnosed, right, you're being told like, oh no, you know, like you feel like you're being dismissed, right? So continue to fight the good fight until, you know, things can be done because there's like, you know, could we fight harder? You know, did we fight hard enough? Did we do everything we could? Yeah. And trust your gut. Always trust your gut. (laughs) Yes, right, and then you know, but then the doctor like, oh, you know, you're overprotective, you know, you're just, right. So even then, when they're telling you that, don't stop, right, because that's the thing. They're, of course, they're going to say that, but don't stop, don't stop, to you know, just continue to be that person, right, until every stone is unturned. <laughs> so, yeah. So our website is www.danielsharbor.com uh, on the website. And then there's also the page for the foundation on our website. But then we also have the social media pages. We have the Daniels Harbor um, Therapy Center, Facebook, and Instagram. And then we also have the Daniel D. Garza Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. And then um, our email address is info at danielsharbor.com. And we're located in Navarre, Florida. just fight right and knowing that what you're feeling is normal what you're feeling is valid right all the feelings that you're feeling they're valid Mm